Good morning. My name is Nicholas Piotrowski, as Drew mentioned. I'm the president of Indianapolis Theological Seminary, uh, and it is uh, my joy to be with you this morning. Now, I know that every time a guest speaker speaks somewhere, they tell the congregation, it's my joy to be here. But I mean it. I mean it. Uh, because of the fond feelings I have for this congregation as the president of Indianapolis Theological Seminary, you've supported us pretty much from the beginning. Uh, good friends here. Great to see you, Dick. Bless you, brother. Uh, here in this congregation, uh, and I'm, I'm just grateful for the warm welcome that I had at the men's retreat this weekend. Not, a, not one of the men of ZF, nonetheless, they included me in, uh, in all their activities and made me feel welcome, made me feel like one of the, one of the guys this weekend, and it was uh, my joy to be with them. Uh, however, the uh, brief sort of advertisement I heard for the men's Christmas tea, I don't need an invitation for that. <laughs> The women's tea sounds great. Well, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Psalm 72. We're going to look at two passages from the Scriptures this morning, and we're going to start with Psalm 72. And let me just tell you the main point of the message this morning is to ask the question, can we trust the Bible? Can we trust the Bible? Why this question? Well, this weekend at the men's retreat, we were thinking about what are the stories that the world tells, especially in our cultural moment right now, the stories that pervade our culture that shape our imagination, shape our understanding of the world in terms of what is good, what is true, and what is beautiful. Well, the Bible answers these questions as well. What is good, what is true, what is beautiful. The Bible is the inspired, revealed Word of God. And through the Scriptures, we know who God is, what is a human being, what's wrong with human beings, what's wrong with the world, what's wrong with us, and then therefore, the solution. <laughs> Depending on what you think a human is and what the problem with humanity is, will tell you, well, what then is the solution? And so we understand that God created uh, all people, as Drew said, in his image. Uh, but the problem is we have rebelled against that good creator, and we are sinners. Therefore, the problem is our sin, the solution therefore must be some kind of atonement for sin, which the Bible tells us is, of course, the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in the Scriptures, just a basic outline, you've got the, the, the reality of God the creator, what is Humanity? What's wrong with humanity? What's the solution? And therefore, this gives us hope in the world. But it's these very questions, these very questions, that our culture is deeply, deeply confused about. Who is God? We don't know. And therefore, what is humanity? What is a man? What is a woman? What are we for? We're deeply confused. And if we don't know who we are and what we are, then we also don't know how to diagnose, well, what's our problem? Is it ignorance? Is it lack of freedom? You know, what is it? It's not sin. It must be something else. Therefore, the world creates a bunch of solutions to solve these imagined problems, none of which provide any hope. So you can just see, by looking at the world, how these kinds of questions are just in disarray and there's so much misunderstanding. Well, if the Bible answers them for us, we need to ask this question. Can we trust the Bible? Does the Bible actually have better answers, a better story to explain who is God, what is humanity, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with all of us, and where can we find the solution? And so that's why I want to focus our attention today on that urgent question. Is the Bible trustworthy to give me these answers that is so clear we need at this moment. Charles Spurgeon is alleged to have said, defend the Bible, I would just as soon defend a lion. Well, I've looked all over Spurgeon's writings as far as I could find. It's not there. <laughs> I, th I think that if there's a really good line uh, and we don't know who to describe it to. We say, that must be a Spurgeon, <laughs> especially if it's really clever. Here's what I did find. It's close. Here's what I did find. In a sermon from January 1888 called 
the lover of God's law fulfilled with peace. He says, the word of God can take care of itself. And it will do so if we preach it and cease defending it. See you that lion? They have caged him for his preservation. Shut him up behind iron bars to secure him from his foes. See how a band of armed men have gathered together to protect the lion. What a clatter they make with their swords and their spears. These mighty men are intent upon defending a lion. O fools and slow of heart, open the door. Let the Lord of the forest come forth free. Who will dare encounter him? What does he want with our guardian care? Let the pure gospel go forth in all its lion-like majesty, and it will soon clear its own way and ease itself of its adversaries. And Spurgeon is right. To defend the Bible is like defending a lion. We should let it out. And that is what Christian churches do every Sunday, every time we teach. In many ways, the existence of this very church is an exercise in letting out the lion, opening the scriptures, letting the content come forth, listening to it, learning it, and applying it to our lives. And so it is good to reflect on why we do that. Why do we preach? Why do we teach specifically the Bible? So today we'll ask the all-important question, can we trust this Bible that we listen to and we learn from every week. I'll give you the thesis of the sermon right now. Yes. <laughs> yes. We can trust the Bible and we must trust the Bible because the Bible is not just good advice. The Bible makes promises and claims on our lives that we must take very seriously. And so we must trust the Bible because it is good it is true, and it is beautiful. It is these three characteristics of the Bible that raise our confidence in its trustworthiness. The Bible is good, the Bible is true, and the Bible is beautiful. Now, I wish, I wish I could just camp on that second one. Is the Bible true? That ought to be enough. If something is true... <laughs> You are morally bound to obey it, right? But in our world today, people are asking more questions than just, is the Bible true? They also want to know, is it good? They see in the Bible issues of war and homosexuality. And so they want to know, is the Bible good? Can it speak to those issues? And equally, the question of beauty should ever be before us. And by beauty, I don't mean what does the Bible look like. But the Bible's ability to reach into our innermost being and touch us and stir us unlike anything else because it brings us into communion with the most beautiful being there is, the creator triune God. He is beautiful, and therefore the Bible leads us to the ultimate expression of beauty. So with that, we'll look at these three attributes. These three attributes of the Bible today, that it is good, that it is true, and that it is beautiful. And if you're a believer, my hope is that this will raise your confidence in the Scriptures all the more. So that you, when you read it, when you hear it, when you study it, you will understand it as what it is. The Word of Almighty Creator God. There's a particular university professor in uh, North Carolina who teaches the Bible, but he doesn't particularly believe it. And on the first day of class, he, raises, he asks the students to raise their hands. Uh, how many of you believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God? And like 80% of the hands go up. Okay? Then he says, how many of you have read the whole thing? And 10% of the hands go up. And he says, well, you would think that if you believe this is the word of Almighty God, you would read it. Okay, how many of you read Harry Potter? Every one of them. And all the hands go back up. So, <laughs> you're reading Harry Potter, but not the Word of God. My hope 
is that this will raise your confidence in the trustworthiness of the Bible as the expression of the will of the Creator, Almighty God, so that you will read it, you will hear it, you will learn it, you will memorize it, you will apply it to your lives, because that's exactly what it is, the Word of God. If you're not a believer, if you're not a believer here today, I know you're welcome in this place. I hope you will reflect on why these Christians take the Bible so seriously. The, the world is full of books. Why is this one so paramount? And that you too might catch a glimpse of its goodness, its truth, and its beauty, and therefore be invited to study it as well. And I know for a fact, Drew and many others here would love to read the Bible with you. All you have to do is find Drew or one of the other, uh, Eric, I'm sure is the same, in the foyer, and set up a time when they read the Bible with you. What makes this thing so good, so true, and so beautiful? So let's begin with this. Let's begin with this. Let's begin with chapter 1, paragraph 5 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Did I already tell you to turn to Psalm 72? Okay, we'll get there. We're going to start with the Westminster Confession, chapter 1, paragraph 5. Listen to this. It says, We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture. And that's what I'm going to try to do right now. I'm going to try to induce you to a high and reverent esteem for Holy Scripture. But it goes on. And the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, and the scope of the whole, which is to give glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, and many incomparable excellencies and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it doth manifest evidence itself to be the word of God. In other words, the highest court of appeal, the clearest evidence that the Bible is the word of God is not my sermon today. God be praised for that. It's not any kind of archaeological evidence or apologetic argument you might discover. It's the Word of God itself. All these characteristics, the consent of the part, the discovery of the way of man's salvation, the scope of the whole, the incomparable excellencies, the coherency of it all, testified to itself that this is the Word of God. Yet, it goes on, notwithstanding, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. That the Spirit who inspired the word of God then uses the word of God to convince you that the word of God is the word of God. And that convincing can take many forms. And many realizations, we're looking at just three today. So number one, the Bible is good. The Bible is good. How is the Bible good? The Bible is good because it teaches you how to be good. How to be good. In other words, the Bible gives us clear instruction on morality, on ethics. What is good what is evil? The Bible is very clear on these things. Over against the sort of bobber effect we have in our culture today where everything is changing all the time, the Bible is a stable anchor at understanding what is good. Take just, take just the Ten Commandments. Look at just the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were understood by Israel as the greatest gift God ever gave to humanity. They had lived for hundreds of years in Egypt in this dark place where the, 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 the gods of Egypt never revealed their moral will, never told anybody what is expected of humanity because they don't exist and they don't speak. But the point is, they were in complete darkness. So when they come to Mount Sinai after the great exodus, the great liberation from Egypt, and God gives them the Ten Commandments, he is just shining light into the dark world. And ever since then, in the history of Israel, they've understood the Ten Commandments as the greatest gift that God has ever given to humanity. Not cars, not vacation, not leisure, not money, not health, but a clear instruction on what is right, what is good, how ought you live your life for human flourishing. 
And Israel equally understood that the rest of the world is also in darkness, not just Egypt. It's all the nations of the earth ever since we got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. We've been in darkness to what the will of God is. And the Ten Commandments just open that up to tell us about family, about the preservation of life, about goods, about speaking the truth. Take as well the Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is not giving us really anything new there. But he's pulling back the layers of the Ten Commandments to tell us things like, okay, you have heard it said, thou shalt not murder. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Very good. But Jesus also instructs us not to even hate our enemies. For when we hate people from the heart, we've murdered them in our hearts. Equally, you've heard it said, you should not commit adultery. It's also true, right? It's also good, part of the good instruction of of the Ten Commandments. Now, you may think, of course you shall not murder. Of course you shall not commit adultery. Do you really need the Ten Commandments for that? Yes, we do. Look around at the world. We need the moral instruction for the Ten Commandments. But Jesus also says, uh, it's not just adultery, but if you lust in your heart after someone, you have committed adultery in your heart. So Jesus is taking the moral will of God and calling his people to live it out from the heart such that we would even love our enemies. Now, just think for a minute. Just think for what a society would look like if they just had and applied the Ten Commandments and Jesus' instruction to apply the Ten Commandments from the heart. What would that look like? You see, the Bible gives us clear instruction on what is good. In these days, we are drifting all over the place. The Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount alone, let alone the rest of the moral teaching of the Bible, gives us a solid anchor to understand what is good in this world. Secondly, the Bible is also good because it teaches us the way of human flourishing. This is why I ask you to turn to Psalm 72. Psalm 72, as you'll notice from the, what's called the superscript, this little piece above verse 1, call it verse zero, it says, of Solomon, or your translation might say for Solomon or even by Solomon. The point is, this is a poem of praise to God in light of the reign of King Solomon. Now, why is King Solomon so important? Because he is the descendant of David, and he was the king at the apex of Israel's history. The king's primary responsibility is To make it simple, obey the Ten Commandments and model a life that obeys the Ten Commandments so that the people of God also will live into a flourishing society. And so look at how it begins. It begins, give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. You hear the word justice twice, righteousness twice. If the king will live out the law of God. Justice and righteousness will reign throughout the land. Jump down to verse 6. When that happens, the psalmist says, May there be abundance of grain in the land. On the tops of the mountains, may it wave. May its fruit be like Lebanon. And listen to this. May the people blossom in the cities like the grass of the field. What a beautiful image. When righteousness and justice flow from the king, the good law of God is coming from the top. Look at the goodness that happens amongst the people. They blossom. What a beautiful image. We all know what it looks like for uh, flowers to come up in the spring. And Uh, after the the snow and the cold and they they shoot up and they open up and they receive the sun and they receive the rain and all the good things that the garden has for it. And in turn, the flower beautifies the garden. So the the flower receives from the garden, the flower gives to the garden, and that's what it means when a flower blossoms. So people, he's saying people are like that. People blossom, receive the good things from the world, give back to the world, and live and are beautiful themselves. The opposite, of course, of blossoming is what? Wilting. Fading. 
I think in our world today, there's a lot of wilting and a lot of fading, right? Drug use, suicides, all kinds of human problems are being amplified more and more than ever because, again, we're so cut adrift. We don't see people blossoming. We see them fading and wilting. That's not the vision of the Bible, though. That the goodness of God's moral instruction pervading a society would result in blossoming. And this psalm, Psalm 72, is ultimately fulfilled in the coming of Christ. Jesus Christ is the ultimate son of David who brings righteousness and justice to the earth that is to be lived out amongst his people so that as they grow and spread all over the earth, they bring righteousness and justice with them, which they learn from King Jesus, so that there will be blossoming in the places where they are. And so I would submit to you that some of the good, most of the good things in the world today that contribute to human blossoming and flourishing have grown out of the Christian tradition, could only grow out of the tradition of Christianity because of the influence of the Bible. Let me give you an example. Several examples, and I'll be quick. Democracy. If you like democracy, you have the Bible to thank. You have the Bible to thank. Specifically, democracy in our, war, in our country was set up because of the biblical understanding of the corruption of the sinful heart. Right? Thomas Jefferson, not a Christian, right? But the reason things get set up the way they are with a federal government, a state government, division of powers in all these governments is to take power and diffuse it over as many people and as many layers as possible. Federal, state, local, president, Congress, courts, and diffuse power all over the place because if power is consolidated in any one place, even the most noble of human hearts is still sinful and will therefore become corrupt and take advantage of their power and take advantage of others. So our whole system is set up to keep people accountable by diffusing power, thereby spreading out the corruption of the human heart and forcing people to be reelected every so often, thereby pushing authority down into the electorate. You can't diffuse power any further than all over the country to every single person. That all originates with the biblical understanding of what is a human being, what is the problem with humanity, and how can we curb those problems in our government. Think as well about universities. Universities are, are a good thing. Right, where people can go to learn, uh, uh, focus on learning the best, the most they can on medicine, or art, or architecture, or engineering. There's some Purdue grads out there. I'll leave you out. Right, the idea of the university, the idea that we can bring together the best minds in certain t subjects and bring others into that environment so that they can learn and grow and then also contribute to society, is an entirely Christian idea. An entirely Christian idea. It originated with focusing on training pastors and then thought, well, that worked on training pastors. Let's also train people in these other disciplines so that learning can progress and people can use their learning to help others in the world. That's what doctors do. That's what architects do. That's what engineers do. They create societies of human flourishing through their learning. Or the scientific revolution. The scientific revolution. If you like science, if you like modern medicine, again, you have the Bible to thank. It's Christianity that has understood that the world is orderly and therefore can be studied and therefore can be controlled. Just think for a moment what we're doing right now. We have controlled nature in this room. Outside, it is cold. In here, it is less cold. It's bearable. <laughs> I feel fine. Some of you have your coats on, right? You see what we've done here? Only creatures made in God's image who understand how the world works can therefore control parts of the world, like make a room like this and create a furnace and turn on the lights. Only those made in God's image. 
And the reason we do that, the reason the whole scientific enterprise began is because of this conviction that the world is organized and therefore we can understand its order. Now you may think, well, of course that's the case. Anybody can see that. The only reason you think that is because you've been so influenced by the Christian tradition. Your ancestors and my ancestors saw the world as chaotic. Forces at work at the whims or the negligence of the gods. The gods who live on the mountains, the spirits over the river, or whatever it may be. That the world is just a chaotic place and unpredictable it's Christianity that comes along and says, well, there's one God, one creator who made the world with an intention and an irrationality to it. Therefore, you can understand it and you can apply it and you can control it. So there's democracy, university, science, or how about hospitals and education for everybody? Hospitals and education for everybody. And I mean elementary school education has not been a guaranteed privilege for every child throughout the ages. It's Christians who came along and said, you know what? We should teach children how to read, and we should teach every child how to read, regardless of whether or not they could afford it or not. We should take people into our hospitals and treat them because we value life, whether they can afford it or not. Or even capitalism. This is where I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to go out on a limb here. Capitalism. Some people think capitalism is simply a structure for the greedy, the rich greedy, to get richer off their greed. <laughs> That's how some people see it. But Adam Smith, who is the father of modern capitalism, himself not a Christian, but deeply influenced by the Calvinist tradition he was in, saw capitalism as a function of love of neighbor. Love of neighbor. It looks like this. If I have a good or a service that will help you and serve you, and I'm willing to provide a good service and make a good product and sell it to you, you'll be willing to pay me a fair rate so that I can do what? Make more of these goods, produce more of these services to bless others. And so there's this reciprocal relationship between trying to bless you with my goods and services and you bless me with income so I can continue with my goods and services. Whereas those who do crummy work and provide a poor service will be pushed out through that kind of dynamic. The end of which is that everybody gets better goods and better services. So even capitalism was motivated by a Christian influence of love of neighbor. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, Every single one of those institutions is still laced with sin. There's, none of them are perfect because we still have, remember what, how this all got started with democracy, sinfulness in our hearts. All the same, in and of themselves, they are good institutions that produce human thriving for the people who benefit from engineers, science, democracy, university, of which we are all the beneficiaries. And so while such institutions, of course, can have all sorts of sin intermixed, their basic concepts are good and brought to us, handed down through the ages by people who read the good book. The Bible is good. Number two, the Bible is true. The Bible is true. Now, when people think about, well, is the Bible true, normally what they're asking about is the historical accuracy, the historical accuracy of the Bible. Can I believe that the events in the Exodus or the events of David's life or the events of the Gospels really happened? They're asking about historical details. And there are plenty of books that you can look at that. But I want to focus on another angle. I want to ask about the nature of how the Bible came to be written. That is, I want to focus on the claim that the Bible is revealed. The Bible is revealed by God to us. There are many who believe that the Bible is a, uh, a collection of human reflections on the deity. 
human opinions about what God might be like. It is a bottom-up kind of reflection. That's not what we believe at all. The Bible itself claims that it comes not bottom-up, human beings thinking about God, but rather God telling us about himself. That's what we mean by revealed. Learning from God what only God can know about himself. And this is important. This is vitally important to understand because while we can confirm historical accuracy, and I can recommend some books that do that, historical accuracy, the Old and New Testaments of the Bible, that doesn't mean our work is done, though it really helps. Because historical accuracy does not prove or guarantee that the claims and the promises of the Bible are true. The claims and the promises. For example, for example, If I know who won the Indianapolis 500 this year, I know some historical facts. But that doesn't change my life. That doesn't change my life. My life is no better or worse because of who won or the fact that I know who won the Indianapolis 500. There's no response that's called, that I'm called to, to use that historical truth. The Bible, on the other hand, is full of claims and promises based on historical truths. So if we can confirm that Jesus died for sins, or I'm sorry, let me back up. If we can confirm that Jesus died historically, there's still the question, so what? So what? Everybody in history has ever died. Why should Jesus' death be special at all? Or if we can confirm through historical investigation that Jesus was raised to life, again, the question becomes, so what? Great for Jesus, but what does that do for me? What does that do for me? But the Bible claims that Jesus' death is special because it can forgive you of your sins. That Jesus' resurrection is important because it means you too will receive resurrection life. The Bible tells us you can be forgiven. You can be reconciled to God. You can be adopted into his family. Those are not things that can be confirmed by mere historical verification. So how do we know that we can trust that Jesus' death is special, incomparable to every other death? That his resurrection means that we can have eternal life? And the answer is because the Bible is inspired. The Bible is revealed from God. So the real question becomes, how do we know that? Why should we have confidence in that? Why should we trust that this book truly comes from God and it's not just a reflection of human uh, opinions about God? The answer is because the resurrected Jesus himself gives us the Bible. While Jesus never put pen to paper, he himself stands behind every word of the Bible. And as the resurrected man, he stands in a place of authority to know what is true. To see this, turn in your Bibles to John 13. And this will be a brief recap for the men, and I hope edifying for everybody. How do we know that the Bible's claims and promises, particularly about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, are true? Because the resurrected Jesus himself is guaranteed that everything in the Bible is true. So in John 13, it says, verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own to the end, who are in the world, he loved them to the end. So the rest of the Gospel of John is about Jesus' departure. He knows his time is short. And in this context, he's talking to his disciples, 12, but then when Judas leaves, it'll be 11 followers in this room. And look at what he says to them in chapter 14, verse 25. Knowing that he's leaving now, this is what he says to his followers. John 14, 25 and 26. These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you. But the helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. 
What's important to understand here is this is not a blanket statement to the world. This is a very specific promise to those men who were there that night, those 11. He's saying, look, I've taught you many things, but I got to go now. But when I ascend to heaven, I will give my own Holy Spirit who will lead you to remember everything that I have taught you. And that's how we know Jesus is talking to those specific men that night. I wasn't there. I wasn't with Jesus throughout his ministry. There's nothing for me to remember. So he's singling out these 11 men to receive the Holy Spirit in a very special way to help them remember everything that Jesus taught. Now, I'll be clear, the Spirit is a gift to all Christians. But we also already know that the Spirit works in different ways. There are different spiritual gifts for different Christians, right? So what's happening here is that the very unique way of remembering Jesus' teachings is promised to Jesus' disciples. Jump down to chapter 16 and look at verses 20, uh, 12 and following. John 16, 12 and following. I still have many things to say to you. This is still the same context. I'm about to depart. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority or whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. He will take what is mine, the knowledge, the truth that is mine, and declare it to you all And here I think it means all the knowledge and truth that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Do you hear the uninterrupted line from the Father to the Son through the Spirit to tell these, to lead these 11 men into, I mean, look what it says, all the truth. This is an awesome claim that after I'm resurrected and I ascend to heaven, I will send my very spirit to make sure you remember everything that I've said and you will get everything right. You will know all truth in what you teach about me. Now, this is how we, this is, this is another reason why we know this is not a generic statement and doesn't apply directly to me (laughs) because I don't know all truth. And there are many occasions in my life where I have been wrong. And you know the same is true about you. So for this promise to have any teeth, it has to have real content to real people. And he is promising the disciples that the Spirit of Christ himself will guarantee that what they know and what they teach is all the truth. Now, why does it matter to you and me 2,000 years later, that those 11 guys got this really awesome promise. Because they're the ones who wrote the Bible. The 11 people in that room that night, and Paul is added to the mix later by Jesus' prerogative, write the New Testament. And the New Testament, by the way it uses and verifies authoritatively the Old Testament, shows that the Old Testament is also the truth because they lean on it so much. Does that make sense? So when you read the Bible, you are not reading the first century Jewish reflection on what God might be like. You are reading the words of Jesus, the resurrected man himself. Through his spirit, he has guaranteed to these men and therefore to us that what they teach will be, I mean, this is an awesome claim, all the truth. Jesus is making an all-inclusive promise that will allow of no exceptions. Therefore, the entire teaching of the apostles, which includes using the Old Testament to prove, to write their books, is the truth. And so, if you want to know what is the meaning of Jesus' death, why does that matter to me? Or what is the meaning of Jesus' resurrection? Why should I care? The Bible has the truth about those things. It's Jesus himself who tells you that his death atoned for your sins. It's Jesus himself who tells you 
That because he was raised to life, he therefore has the power to raise you back to life. And there will be a resurrection of all of his people to enter into the eternal state when he returns. It's Jesus himself who tells you you're forgiven. It's Jesus himself who tells you you're reconciled. It's Jesus himself who tells you you are adopted into the family of God. And it's a Trinitarian confidence, therefore, that we have. The Father speaks by the Son through the Spirit in the Scriptures. So when you read the Bible, you can hear the voice of the Good Shepherd calling to you, leading you in the truth claims of his death and his resurrection. The Bible is good, and the Bible is true. Finally, the Bible is beautiful. The Bible is beautiful. This matters because we are people of senses, of senses, and our senses tell us things. We see a beautiful gardenscape, We hear a harmonious and touching melody. We taste something exquisite for the first time. We touch a newborn child. We smell the fresh air, and we are moved. We are reminded that life can be beautiful, and we have a new appreciation for the joy of life. Thus, God made in God's image. We, unlike any other creature, have an appreciation for the beautiful, and we are drawn to the beautiful. There's an allurement of beautiful things to see, smell, taste, touch, and hear. All of these instincts to be drawn to the beautiful are vestiges of being created in the image of God. Here's what I mean. The most beautiful thing in all the universe is a being— the Trinitarian God. He is the most beautiful of all things that can be called beautiful. And because we're made in his image, we are drawn to that beauty. And so therefore, our taste for other beautiful things is but a small sampling of that image of God in us that no other creature has. And so I'll remind you of what the Westminster Confession says. We come to the Bible because the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of its parts, the scope of the whole is to give the glory of God. And so in reading the scriptures, you come into the experience of the beauty of the glory of God. The point of the scriptures is to put before your eyes all the ways that God himself is good, true, and beautiful. And so from the very beginning, everything that God does is to demonstrate the full panorama of his glory before your eyes. Whether it's creation or the call of Abraham, the Exodus story, the life of Israel, the rise of David and Solomon, and most especially the life and teachings of Jesus Christ and the origins of the church on the day of Pentecost are all for the purpose of showing you how beautiful the Creator God and Redeemer God is. Paul even calls conversion, conversion, coming to Christ, a realization of the beauty and the glory of God. He says in 2 Corinthians 4, when someone comes to know Christ, when they're converted From the darkness to the light. He says it's because God, the God who said, let light shine out of darkness. The the God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Has shown into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what conversion is. Conversion is when you hear the gospel or read it in the scriptures. However you encounter the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, that is glorious. He is beautiful. He meets my needs. He forgives me. He answers my questions of what is good, true, and beautiful. And the lights come on, and we see God for who he is, glorious and beautiful. And it's the Bible that reveals that. It's the Bible that creates communities that reinforce that. Well, we should conclude. I make no pretense. (laughs) 
that in 35 minutes, I can fully articulate the goodness, the truthfulness, and the beauty of the scriptures. And so I agree with Spurgeon. Just let it out. Just let it happen. And so as you hear biblical preaching and teaching, turn on your ears. Lean into the instruction and see if it doesn't make you a better person. If the goodness of the Bible doesn't equally make you a little bit better as a follower of Jesus Christ. See if it's not true. See if it's not true. Hear the truth claims and reflect on the kind of hope that the death and resurrection gives you and see whether or not the the God of the Bible is truly beautiful himself. And again, if you're not a believer, I hope you leave today with questions in your mind. What do I really think is good? Where do I get my ideas of goodness and ethics and righteousness and justice and morality? Where do they come from? What do I understand of the truth? Who has it and how can I get it? And what do I really think is beautiful? What would constitute the good life in this world? When you come up with no answers for those things, I invite you to turn to the lion that is the scriptures and hear the way the Bible articulates what is truly good, truly true, and truly beautiful. Let's pray together. Almighty God in heaven, we give you great praise that you are speaking and revealing God. You have not left us to grope in the dark, to discover the good, true, and the beautiful on our own, but you have spoken to us. And so we pray indeed that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see the goodness, the truthfulness, and the beauty of your son Jesus Christ in the scriptures. Forgive us in the way we've neglected your word and lead us in these capacities In Jesus' name, amen.